welcome up next Professor William Elegby. I hope uh, Williams Elegby. I hope I've pronounced her name right. She's from the University of Stellenbosch, um, where she is the Deputy Director in the African Proc Procurement Law Unit. Um, as I said, Stellenbosch. So please welcome and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, the room has lost some weight, but it's a good thing. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you a bit about myself. So my name is Shokwe Williams Elegbe. I'm a law professor at Stellenbosch. I teach public procurement law. I have a PhD in public procurement and anti-corruption. Um, I've been an academic for, t for 20 years this year, but I've moved around. So I, I kind of see myself as the Goldilocks of academia because I first worked at, in Scotland, but it was too cold. Then I moved to Nottingham, but it was too wet. Then I moved to Lagos, but it was too hot. <laughs> and now I'm here and I think it's just right. <laughs> okay. Um, so as, as, as she said, I'm the Deputy Director of the African Procurement Law Unit, which was set up about, about 10 years ago because we realized that in relation to public procurement, which is, I'll explain that in a minute, there's very little capacity in Africa. Um, and so we're committed to training, um, you know, obviously students, but also anyone who's interested in public procurement. So we do an online master's in public procurement law and policy at Stellenbosch University. Um, okay, so why am I here? Why is a lawyer here talking about blockchain? And I'm from Nigeria, by the way, if you didn't catch that in my accent already. Okay, so my interest in blockchain, so I said that my background is in public procurement and anti-corruption. And in, you know, when there was a lot of hype about blockchain in 2016, 2017, I was like, what is this thing? What is this thing? And then I, one day I was like, why am I acting confused. I have a PhD. I can read this up, right? I shouldn't behave like a, an old man from Idaho. <laughs> so I went and I, I researched about it. So, and I was trying to think, can, we, can blockchain be a tool to, um, can blockchain be a tool to actually address the issues of corruption in, in public procurement? Um, and so in 2018, I gave my inaugural lecture, which is a big public lecture you have to give when you're a professor. And I was then very, um, very bullish about blockchain and public procurement, and I was a blockchain enthusiast, but I've kind of shifted to become now a blockchain realist, but I didn't tell Sonia that after she invited me. Okay, so um, talking about a few things, I'll talk about the background to public procurement, talk about corruption a little bit, um, and then talk about what we can do with, with the DLT and what the issues will be. Okay, so public procurement is basically when a government or a government department buys the goods and services it needs to function and maximize public welfare. And it can range from the mundane to the, sub, to the sublime. So from paper clips to autonomous weapon systems. So anytime the government buys something, they use what we call the public procurement system and its laws, its institutions, its policies, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of government spending. In South Africa, it's estimated to be 15 to 22% of our GDP. Um, and now because we're spending a lot of money, one of the things that the public procurement system does is that they also try to use this money to achieve other objectives. So for instance, if I want to buy paper, instead of just buying paper, why don't I buy paper that was made from recycled sources? Or why don't I buy paper from a local manufacturer? So we call that either sustainable procurement or smart procurement or, or strategic procurement. Um, now, South Africa, I don't have to tell you about the history. You're mostly South Africans. Because of the, 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 the difficult apartheid history, public procurement is being used to redress the historical injustices that were created by apartheid. So the focus is to give black people access, priority to government contracts. Um, and this has led to some other issues um, which, which you see in the newspapers. Now, the public procurement system is um, a component of our public financial management system, and it cannot outperform that system. So if your public financial management system is crap, then your public procurement system is also going to be um, quite crappy. Okay, so corruption. Now, South Africa is not unique in terms of corruption in public procurement. I'm from Nigeria. We'll not talk about that. Um, so every country has... Um, public procurement has corruption risks in every country because money. We all want money. So you are having Bitcoin wallets because... <laughs> money, right? And, we, and if some people want money even if it's not theirs. Um, now, in South Africa, we estimate that about 50% of our procurement spend is lost to fraud and corruption. And that's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal when we're talking about shrinking budgets and cutting, um, you know, losing revenue and all that. Now, in South Africa, corruption in public procurement is exacerbated because we have problems with the educational system. If you have children in primary school, you will see it. We have a, 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 
nepotistic or what they call a CADA deployment system in public administration, which should not be. So it's not a meritocracy. So it's not necessarily the right people that get um, access to, to the jobs. Um, the, PFM, the PFM system is also problematic. Um, and so a lot of problems we have, you know, obviously conflicts of interest, undue influence, fronting, um, lack of transparency, poor contract ma management, and, you know, several, several issues with the South African procurement system. Um, now, when we talk about corruption research, we talk about the fact that corruption arises because of the agency problem. And the agency problem is simply that if you have an agent, so a pub, uh, procurement official, and he has to carry out certain actions on behalf of his principal, the principal could be the government or the citizens, depending on what your leaning is, and if that agent's interests are in conflict with those of his principal, then he's going to do things that, to his own benefit, that would... would not being the, the principal's um, interest. And the way we try to address this agency problem with public procurement is by um, reducing the discretion that the agent has in making decisions. So public procurement in many countries, including South Africa, is highly regulated. There are multiple levels of approval. In South Africa, you have what we call a committee system. So it has to be a committee that makes all the decisions in order to try to limit um, you know, the, the risk of corruption in, in procurement. Um, and so these solutions that we use in, in regulating procurement are some of the um, are similar to the solutions that the blockchain provides in relation to digital currency, maintaining trust, preventing pro, um, fraud, and limiting the risk of, of dishonesty. So in theory, the blockchain can be used to address the issue of um, procurement corruption, but it's not um, it's not that simple. And I'll come to that in, in, in a couple of minutes. So what are some of the issues with procurement in South Africa? Um, and in a way, in a lot of, of other African countries, it's a manual exercise. It includes hard paper documents, time lags. Um, so South Africa is unique in the sense that the Constitution um, talks about procurement and says that procurement has to be carried out in a way that is um, equitable, transparent, fair, uh, competitive, and something else, and cost effective. But it's very difficult to know in a manual process whether you've actually been treated fairly as a bidder. And I'm sure if there's anybody here who has engaged with the public procurement system, you have your complaints, especially if you didn't get the tender right. Um, and then another issue is that we don't, um, there's, there's very little by way of digitization um, and very little data being captured on procurement. And I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, so. What are the opportunities for a DLT platform? I won't talk too much about, but we know about the fact that there's a single record of, um, of the truth. Um, information is protected from, from deletion, tampering, and all that. Increases um, transparency and, and integrity in a process. Um, so in theory, it it's, could be a good idea. Um, a blockchain, the de decentralized nature of a blockchain would um, would or the blockchain would decentralize the information asymmetry in a procurement process. Information asymmetry basically is that it's usually the procurement official and, or officials and the committees that actually have the whole truth. I, as a, as a bidder, I don't have the whole truth. I only know what I submitted. I don't know what the competitors did. I don't even know what the officials themselves are doing. But a blockchain potentially could address that problem, um, address issues of fairness. Of course, there'll be increased agility and all that. And we've seen case studies of how it's being used in the private sector and how it's working to, to, to trace um, you know, to, to track goods and, and all that. Um, so again, in theory, it, it could be useful. Sorry. Um, yeah, okay. Now, I, I had a look at what other jurisdictions are doing, and I came up with a, a couple of, a few countries that are using blockchain or are potentially planning to use blockchain. So Mexico had a hackathon in 2018, 2019, and the winning hack, is that, is that what we will say? The winning hackers, I don't know, hackathoners, um, they won because they had proposed a blockchain system um, that would be, that, or, or a procurement system on a blockchain that would use anonymous citizens to evaluate tenders. Costa Rica is the um, only, well, Co Costa Rica is using a, a blockchain um, for part of their procurement system. So they have a very advanced e-procurement system, but they use blockchain to secure documents because they found that documents on the electronic platform could be tampered. So they secure only the document, but everything else is on the e is not is not a blockchain-based um, platform. In 2019, um, Seoul, I never know how to say that, is testing a system for proposal evaluation using blockchain, and Colombia is also trying to test the platform. So there are a number of tests, there are very little actual uses. 
Um, so some aspects of, a, of public procurement are amenable to a blockchain-based um, system, but not all. And the reason is that with a blockchain, and I think some of the other speakers have already alluded to this, um, the blockchain is not, or the information, the data on a blockchain is not immaculately conceived. It is put in by someone. Now, when you have a culture of criminality, then blockchains benefits are going to be limited because if, the per if people are putting in data that is false, then, then you now have wrong data that is immutable and is permanent. And I think that's a horror story, right? Um, so in, in South Africa, we have a lot of problems. I mean, if you open any news blog or newspaper, you see it. Um, selection of bidders is already, um, is a fait accompli. It's already, um, you know, predetermined in an unethical way. So even if you have a good evaluation pe um, process, the people who have been invited to the party are not the right people, so that's problematic. Um, of course, a blockchain, uh, a procurement platform cannot be based on proof of work or proof of stake. It will be based on proof of authority. And if you have a culture of criminality, if you have people who are not being held to account and are doing what they like, then that is problematic as well. Um, now, just a, a, a brief detour. In terms of public procurement, and I'm talking about public procurement, I'm not talking about private sector. The way public procurement systems have evolved is that we move from analog systems, you know, closed operations, analog procedures. We moved to e-government where we digitize existing government processes, online delivery of public services um, through ICT. And then most countries are moving or have already moved into a digital government where you actually um, use digital technologies and data to transform the design and implementation of public policies and services. Um, so, of course, if you are in South Africa, you know that we're not really digital government. We're um, half analog and hoping to, um, to be e-government in some, in some ways. So, thinking about um, a, a DLT platform for, for procurement, it may be a little bit um, premature. Um, there are a number of issues. I've said that we barely tapped into e-government. Um, in the, in the public sector, and I think part of this is because of the fact that when we, the public sector does not, or many areas of the public sector don't operate as a meritocracy, so we, we have in the in inadequate data skills. We need to be thinking about really how we would um, upgrade digital literacy and capability in the public sector. We, we know we, we need a, a data-driven public sector. It's something that we don't have a, at the moment. And even a clear strategy. There have been a number of strategies on, you know, um, for IR and digital government, but there are many ad hoc initiatives. And if you do a search on the internet, you'll find evidence of things that were done in 2013 and then stopped, and then done in 2015 and then stopped. So as you have a government and they have one idea, they push it for a little bit, but there's no follow through. Um, and so, yeah, so just too many um, ad hoc initiatives. Now, one of the challenges that I've found is the fact that if we w were thinking about a blockchain Based platform for procurement, um, how would we incorporate with existing um, databases? So a few years ago, the central supply database was created, and that has been integrated with, with, with SARS. So if you want to, if you're going to be a government supplier, you have to register on that database, and that database basically tells the organs of state or the government departments whether your tax um, your tax affairs are in order and whether or not you've been excluded for government, from government contracts for doing something wrong. Um, another, pro probably a bigger problem, um, especially talking about smart contracts, is that computer logic requires complete information. And government tenders are notoriously based on incomplete information. Because in many cases, especially when we talk about things that are a little bit more complex, governments may not actually know what it is they need. And they actually use the tender process as a means of information revelation. So we can't have a smart contract because we don't have all the information that we can um, you, you know, use to program the code. Um, common standards across the public sector. Uh, uh, like a couple of years ago, so yeah, 2018, uh, 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 some, some scientists in America did a study um, in trying to build a DLT platform for procurement. And they found out that, well, the platform that they used could only accept documentation um, that, was, that was very limited. So they, they, their assessment was that it cannot be used for, for a, a um, the blockchain cannot be used for public procurements because of, 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 of the limitations that they found. Um, now, I suppose another big challenge is that the most useful blockchains in relation to transparency 
um, are those that are opened and permissionless. But you're never going to have the public sector give up that degree of control um, for, a, 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 for a permissionless blockchain. So we're not, we're, we're not going to see them doing that. It's going to be closed. It's going to be permissioned. And some of the biggest benefits of a blockchain are, are, then, are, then, um, you know, are, are then not going to be there. Um, so I'm a lawyer, so I was looking again at the legal framework. Does it support, um, does it support, um, you know, digital technologies? Um, current law in South Africa says any procurement contracts can only, any procurement disputes can only go to the high court. So there's no arbitration, there cannot be online resolution, it has to go offline and it has to go to the, to the high courts. So that's one issue. Um, do, uh, so, the, so the current legal framework does not allow for online dispute resolution, for instance. And how do we resolve disputes that are done you know, on a blockchain without undermining the integrity of the system? Um, now, just two weeks ago, 19th of February, um, the government released the draft procurement bill, opened it for comments to the public. And so I was having a look, that, okay, this is new legislation. We have a 4IR presidential commission. For sure, the public procurement law is going to tell us how we're going to use 4IR technologies to do public procurement. And it was a bit of a letdown. So there's a, there's a, a section there that says as much as possible, um, organs of state or government departments must use technology, and then every other section after that contemplates a manual process. So they say you must open bids in a certain place at a certain time. When you open those bids, you must write down the amount of the bid and the name of the bidder. Um, if you need any information from the new regulator, you must send him a written request. So they're not actually envisaging that we'll be doing things online. They're envisaging that it's going to be more, uh, more of the same. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of, and so if that bill becomes law, now we've been waiting for this bill for the past seven years, so we're expecting that once the public consultation period is over, it will be passed with, you know, whatever amendments, but it does not actually give us a platform for, for digitization in public procurement. Um, so I mentioned already earlier that we collect very little procurement data. And I will tell you how little procurement data we collect in South Africa. Now, to give you some context, last year, the gov total government expenditure was about 1.8 trillion rand. This year, it's 1.95. And it was estimated that about 800 billion rand was spent on procurement. And they said about 50% of that was lost. But of the money that was actually spent, we cannot tell you who we spent it on, what we bought, and what we did. So the Commission of Gender Equality um, they were trying to find out in, in last year how many contracts go to female-owned businesses because that's part of their, their, their mandate, right? And so they approached um, four of the biggest government departments in South Africa to say, please give us data on your procurement and give us data on how many contracts and you know, give us disaggregated data on what is going to female-owned businesses. And of those four, not one of the biggest departments could give them disaggregated data. So they could say, we spent 200 million rand. Um, there, was one that, there was one department that said, we actually remember giving a contract to an Indian woman. No, this, it, it's mind boggling. So for me, thinking about blockchain for procurement, then I sat down and I was like, this is like telling a person who has not been in a taxi that they must go into a rocket ship. It's not possible. Go into a taxi, feel comfortable with the movement. <laughs> and then maybe we'll get you in a, into a boat or an aeroplane and we take it from there. Um, so I think the priority needs to be to be that, because we cannot, we, I mean, they always say that you cannot um, measure what you don't track, and we're not tracking anything. You can't get data on procurement in South Africa. Procurement is, I have two minutes. Okay, good, because I'm, I'm working with that clock, <laughs> and not with your standing. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, where was I? So yeah, we don't have, we don't have procurement data, and that, that for me should be our, our priority. If we, we're not tracking our spending, we're not doing any spend analysis, they can't tell you what they've spent. Like every year, the Auditor General goes into departments and tries to audit them. And more and more, the Auditor General is giving what they call disclaimed um, audits. Disclaimed, now there, there are four levels. There's unqualified, that's good. Um, qualified, you have problems, and there's adverse findings that you're lying. Disclaimed is that we cannot say anything. We don't, you have no record, so we cannot say if you are good or bad. 
So we're no, no comment. How is that possible that a government department gets a disclaimed? I mean, I mean, is it not funny? I mean, it's crazy. So we have to, we have to push the government that, please, collect data. At least start, even if it's Excel. Let's start somewhere. And you understand. So, so that's what I feel we, we need to, to, for me, anyway, that's my new mantra. So I'm not talking about blockchain. I'm like, please, can we collect data? Um, and yeah, ag across all organs of state. Um, professionalize the um, procurement function. Um, we need um, mandatory ethics in the public sector, but I don't know. That one, God will help us. <laughs> so I'll finish with this quote. If we're moving to um, digital technologies, we need a paradigm shift. We'll need strategic vision and leadership commitments, suitable organizational and government frameworks. Um, and notably, political support and engagement with the private sector, which is happening here. Um, and those are the major enablers for public sector adoption of emerging technologies. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is Songezo, my former student. Uh, so, <laughs> pr so, Professor, three things. <laughs> Number one, thank you for a great presentation. Number two, I want to say, I think if you do lecture often, your students are very lucky to have you as a lecturer because you certainly are a great teacher and it was very entertaining, so thank you. Thank you. And number three, you dealt with load shedding very well so, and very eloquently, <laughs> thank so you. thanks very thank much. You.